Okay, do we have everyone up here? Great, so we'll get started now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the partnership of the Historic Boston, I want to welcome you to this afternoon's event. Uh, I'm Sid Levitsky, president of the Partnership of Historic Boston. Uh, and with me today is Sarah Stewart, who is our vice president, communicator, organizer, and manager of our website, <laughs> as well as many other things. As many of you know, the partnership is a public history organization focused on 17th century New England that attempts to present an all-encompassing, accurate historical view involving indigenous Native Americans, European immigrants, and, and eventually enslaved African Americans. Our activities include a series of lectures, book discussions, historic tours, and special events such as this afternoon. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization and appreciate your contributions, which can be processed via our website. Uh, this afternoon, we're especially fortunate to have as our guide Dr. Stephen Kenny, who's the director of Commonwealth Museum and board member of the partnership. Steve, thank you. Yours. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge <laughs> sometimes the more distinguished the person is, the shorter the introduction has to be. <laughs> <laughs> he is chief of professor of cardiac surgery at Harvard Medical School. And he was a history major in college, so I hope that's right to him. We're, we're very delighted to be able to work with you and with all the other members of the board. So just to give you an overview, as most of you have been here before, is that right? If you're new, then we have four uh, floors of documents, several million. They go back to the time of John Winthrop and the Puritans. And a few years ago, we had an initiative to put up the most important ones on display. And then you will see them in the Treasures Gallery. They're comparable to what you will see at the National Archives. And we're going to have a little presentation of it very brief before we get down to see them. Um, one of them is the Bill of Rights that was sent by President Washington. So because the documents established the government and set out ideas about rights, the theme of the exhibit is tracing the development of rights through the different periods in Massachusetts history. And uh, we worked with Cambridge Seven Associates. They are a firm in Harvard Square. They are both architects and exhibit designers. And they had a subcontractor. They were called Ched Angier at that time. That name may not mean anything to you, but if you're familiar with the Nova series, Ched Angier developed the Nova series for PBS. So there's a successor firm. We still work with them. And they just redid, updated our film that you'll be seeing as well. So when you go in the galleries, there are facsimiles of documents from our collection, but the Treasures Gallery has originals. And each of the galleries has an interactive, in some cases there are electronic interactives or videos, and in some cases there are mechanical interactives that appeal to children, sort of. So, Special today, we wanted, before we begin, to show some documents that are not usually on display. So these are from the vaults. And I'm going to pull this up for a second. The board was sent to France to do research in the archives to find things that might complement our collections here. And he found a vendor who was selling antique maps. So he bought maps. Um, and that we have them in our collection now. We refer to them as the French maps. Some of them were made in France, some were in Belgium. So the first one on the left, you'll get to come up and see it. I'm gonna hold this up first to give you an idea of it. And when we work with kids, we say, where do you think this is? And nobody knows where that would be. And then, you know, you turn it. <laughs> And you know that it's Cape Cod. So that was kind of a fun thing. They did not have the convention of putting North at the top. And the title of this is Nova Belgica and Anglia Nova. Belgica is the Latin word for the Low Countries. So that's really the New Netherlands and uh, New England. So you'll see that. The next one I won't pull up. You can see it. It's a French map. And it's pretty good. I think the, uh, they emphasized Le Grand Bank. You know, fishing was very important, and that was something that drew people to this area. So that's on the map. 
Uh, some of the other things you'll recognize, like the Great Lakes, I don't think they're perfect, but you can see what they are. One of them, Lake Michigan, is called Lake Illinois, and Lake uh, Huron is called Lake Frontenac. But the highlight on that is California. It's shown as an island, so nobody <laughs> can actually get out there yet. But there are some names on there, like S. Barbara, so uh, some of the, they're aware of some of the settlements there. Um, this year, our theme was Native American history in New England, and we have a few documents related to that. We have quite a few deeds in the vaults, very difficult to read, so we selected things that are somewhat legible. This is the deed for the sale of Cape Cod, and I'm going to read off what they paid for Cape Cod. It is uh, two brass kettles, six coats, 12 hoes, 12 axes, 12 knives, and a box. And the native people retain the right to set their wigwams and to gather food and firewood. And they also can have any whales that wash up, as well as blackfish, porpoise, and blubber. So it sounds funny, but it's not really funny if you think about it. And what we have uh, sometimes a high school group will say, did the people who sold that have the authority to sell it, for one thing? Uh, did both sides understand it the same way? It seems to be an agreement in part to share the land. And initially, Native people thought that was what was happening. And basically, is it fair? And one of, based on what I read off to you, you can see that it's not fair. So take a look at that. Uh, these are additional things uh, related to Native Americans. And the first one, I think, up over here is John Elliott's petition. Let me make sure I don't read them upside down. Yeah. As you know, John Elliott was the missionary to the Indians, and 100 years ago he would have been seen as a saintly figure. I think he still was very idealistic, but I think Native people are often uh, critical of him today because they, felt he, they feel that he suppressed the culture. But that is a, is a petition for additional land for a Native village. And as you know, Natick was the first praying Indian town. The land came from Dedham. He is there requesting additional land from Dedham. He didn't get all that he wanted, but I selected that because it's somewhat legible and you can see his signature. Um, next one, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. If, if I'm not, maybe someone would know, but the Squaw Sachem, well, people, people say Sachem, but I think I read phonetically it's Sachem. But in any event, her husband, very powerful, he died. And then she became a very powerful uh, figure for a time. She remarried. And one thing I read about her said that she could see that they were going to be losing land, so she tried to get something for it. And we have a number of things, a number of deeds that she signed, but this is one of them. And it has her pictogram, so you might find that interesting. And also the pictogram of her second husband when, when uh, they sold it, they were married. Uh, this says copy. It's not a copy from uh, the 21st century. At the time, a copy was made for the files, and John Winthrop and John Endicott are commenting on what exactly was given. So they want to make sure someone's not maybe taking their land. Uh, so that's interesting to see her um, <clears throat> pictogram. The next one is from Wabin. And you know, he was thought to be the first praying Indian, the first convert. Um, during King Philip's War, he was out on, uh, on the on, uh, in Boston Harbor with the other uh, Native people. And when the war ended, he was allowed to return to Natick. But he and others submitted this petition for land. It's not aimed at the government of the colonies. It's aimed at another Native person named John Wampus. And a minute ago, I talked about how the question of whether people have the right to sell land. These people, uh, are several of them saying Wampus sold their land, and he really didn't have the right to do that. And it was never really resolved in the lifetime of uh, the people on that. Uh, what happened later was that some of the land was kept by Wampus, and he was a Nipmuc Indian. And some of it was kept by colonists who he sold it to. So uh, it's kind of an interesting story. But I selected that again because you can see the pictographs. Um, let's see, here we have 
this is strange, very strange. I came across this, it's a deposition, and it's not at all funny. Uh, it's about a native person who was murdered. But the deposition is not complete, and I don't know exactly what happened. But the thing that struck me about it is the person that they are deposing is named Zanky Panky. <laughs> and so I don't know if that was an alias or uh, whether the Puritans got that or thought it was an alias or what it meant, but that's on the top line, the deposition of Zanky Panky. You know, kind of a little bit of an interesting question about what was going on here. Okay, here we have another topic. This year we're going to be talking about slavery, and we have a couple of things related to that. You know the case of the rainbow? A uh, group of people decided to go to Africa to take some s slaves and bring them back. Uh, slavery, uh, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, was not too big in the 17th century in New England. I saw an estimate that there were only 14 voyages. There shouldn't be any, obviously, but it was not a major center for it. But a group of people agreed to go over to Africa and to seize some people. And they went over, and according to John Winthrop, uh, on a Sunday, they attacked a place along the coast and killed 100 people with cannons, and then took some of them onto the ship. And when the ship Rainbow came back to Boston, you know, the Puritans looked at the Bible, and they saw that slavery is condoned in the Bible, and, uh, you know, the Israelites could not enslave each other, but they could buy uh, people, they could take people, who were captured in a just war, for example. But this is a case of someone taken violently on a Sunday, and that violated the uh, values of the Puritans, so they sent him back to Africa. So it was kind of an unusual thing. I guess it shows some level of moral awareness. Uh, I was re reading recently a professor in England looking into it. He has a slightly different version of it, and his version is that uh, when they tried to uh, come ashore, the area was very heavily defended, but the local ruler did sell people. So they lured him onto a ship and held him as a hostage, and then uh, they were able to make a trade for some people. I don't know if that's what happened. It's kind of murky, but the idea of it when they came to Massachusetts, I think it's accurate that because it occurred on a Sunday, they were returned to Africa. So a couple of documents related to that. Uh, the other thing is that since Massachusetts was not a major center for the slave trade, the transatlantic trade. Uh, still, the colony profited from slavery by dealing with the islands in the Caribbean. Uh, places like Barbados and Antigua um, would um, maximize profits by planting sugarcane, but then they would um, have to buy food and other things from the colonies. And Massachusetts did not have big surpluses of things like wheat, but they would sell fish, and often fish that had swallowed that was thought to be lower quality. They also provided supplies, um, like hoops to make the uh, barrels for molasses or rum. Um, there are a couple of documents, a bill of lading, a ship that's going to Barbados, carrying a horse. And horses were not used to make it easier for the people in the fields, they were used for the overseers. And they wanted the people in the fields to be very tired so they wouldn't revolt. So there are a couple of things related to that. You might take a look at them. And switching gears, Salem witch trials are very famous. This is a list of women who were held in the jail and the cost for holding them. So you might take a look at that. You see names like Rebecca Nurse, uh, Sarah Good, all familiar names, Bridget Bishop, of people who were executed. Uh, one woman, I think Sarah Osgood, maybe died in jail. And at the bottom of the list you see the name Titaba, and you may know that she was the uh, enslaved woman who was fortune-telling maybe and they got in trouble and decided to deflect attention from herself by accusing <coughs> others, and that started the whole thing. So she was not executed, but you can see she was in jail for a while. This is an act against conjuration, witchcraft, and dealing with evil and wicked spirits. It sounds pretty bad, but it's at the end of this period. In 1692, they realized that it had been a mistake, 
And in this law, they're no longer going to allow spectral evidence. You're not going to be able to say, you know, uh, she's in jail, but her specter is up on the rafter, and now she's sticking pins at me. That no longer to be allowed. That's reproduced in the exhibit. And next to that, they're accompanying it. Uh, there's a law setting up a new court, so there would be a higher court to appeal to. That is considered to be the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts today. That's where it was founded. Okay, the other things here are kind of, I guess, human interest, I would say. You know Nathaniel Ward, this is very difficult to read, but I'll tell you about it. He is the person who's most uh, associated with the Body of Liberties, which was like a Bill of Rights. And this is very interesting, I thought. His son was arrested for burglary. <laughs> and uh, he's saying there, I don't want special treatment for my son. I want this to be in the records. I want him to have to pay restitution. He was expelled from Harvard, and he was vlogged by the president. I'm guessing that's Henry Dunster. It's probably not in the job description today for the president of Harvard. <laughs> but, uh, so he was expelled. He was allowed to come back later. He got a degree from Harvard, and the president actually recommended him for admission to Oxford. So he went to Oxford, and he became a doctor. So uh, it was possible to rehabilitate him, but I, I thought it was a very interesting story about him. Um, this is just interesting. It's an order uh, prevent uh, not allowing smoking within five miles of like a, an open space like Boston Common. And the reason for that was the fear of fires. So um, John Winthrop signs that. You see his signature. Another signature there is Edward Rawson. And he was the secretary of the uh, colony. He has a very distinctive signature. When you're looking through these, you see that slash beneath his name over and over again. I have a, uh, an interesting but sad story about him. Uh, a man came from England who really was a con man, claimed to be from a wealthy family, but he wanted to come here anonymously and make it on his own. And Rawson was a merchant. He courted Rawson's daughter. They were engaged to be married. And uh, there was a dowry. They sent a lot of things on a ship to England. They were married here and then went to England. And when they arrived, uh, he told her, let's just relax a little bit, stay in an inn for a couple of days. I'll take care of uh, get unloading the ship. And then a couple of days later, he said, the, the, uh, all, of the, all of the cases are now unloaded. I'm going to go off and do something else. And when she opened them, everything was gone. He had filled them with rags. Uh, so, you know, she was abandoned in England. And she apparently was pregnant, she had a child, stayed there for a few years and decided to return to America. Her ship stopped in Jamaica on the way and she was killed in an earthquake. So, horrendous story, but uh, again, I, I find that these are human beings and these stories are interesting. We see that name, Edward Rawson, with the slash under it, uh, there's a lot to it. Um, David, a couple more. David Hacker Fisher's book, you may have read it, Albion Seed. He said that they discouraged drinking, which is true, but he said an exception was for a funeral. Sometimes after a funeral, people would drink. And this is a list of food and drink for a funeral at Castle Island. A man was killed when a cannon exploded, and there are gallons of wine and other things there. So that's kind of consistent with that story. Um, finally, if we were doing our greatest hits album, we would have uh, the Scarlet Letter Law. You have to wear A for adultery. And this is the law. And when you come up and look at it, you can see the letter A there. So um, I want to think of how to do this. Maybe I'll do really quickly what's in the Treasures Gallery so we won't be crowded in there. And then we can come by and see all these, and then we'll go downstairs and divide into two groups. So um, if you do the honors. So this charter is no longer like that. It's now encased in the treasures gallery. But, um, you know, that's the William & Mary Charter, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Okay. First thing you see when you enter is Paul Revere's engraving plate for the Boston Massacre. And again, it isn't shown that way, but we uh, did a photo of that to show what it is, you know, is making the print. And, uh, Sometimes people wonder why we have that. He was given a commission to do paper money, and he flipped it over and reversed currency on the, uh, the, the other side of it, on the reverse side. 
And then that was taken into possession by the government to print the money. So it's a public record and we've had it ever since. We have three of his engraving plates uh, because of that. We have the landing of the troops, which is also reproduced in the exhibit. And we have one of Harvard College. Unfortunately, he cut that down the middle and kind of damaged the image. But, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a thing to have. But there was a documentary on the BBC about the American Revolution from the British perspective. And it said uh, it's one of the most effective pieces of propaganda in world history. <laughs> so. Here we are, just quickly, these on the right side, you'll see the two colonial charters. The one on the right is the charter of the Governor and Company of Massachusetts Bay in New England, brought by John Winthrop on the ship Arbella. And these are in climate control cases, uh, argon gas preserves them. A um, bit of trivia that I give about Ann Hutchinson, as you know, we have a descendant of Ann Hutchinson in the audience, uh, Evil Planet. And uh, John Winthrop banished Ann Hutchinson from the colony. Um, John Kerry is a descendant of John Winthrop, and the Bush family are descendants of Ann Hutchinson. So they ran against each other for president in 2004. <laughs> other Hutchinson descendants are on both sides of the spectrum. They include Mitt Romney, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Franklin Roosevelt, and the Auchincloss family. So uh, that's a story I tell a lot, and people find it interesting. Uh, so that's the Massachusetts Bay Colony. I won't give you the whole history of the 17th century, but eventually that was withdrawn. We had the Dominion in New England, and then William and Mary <coughs> issued another charter for the province of Massachusetts Bay, and that's what's on the left there. And that was in place up until the time of the American Revolution. And there's one painting of Samuel Adams, you've all seen it, I'm sure, pointing at a document, it's at the MFA. He's pointing at that charter. So it's fun when we have the kids, we can say, you see this picture? He's actually pointing at that charter and saying the British are not following the rules for governing the colony, especially about taxation. Uh, next, we've got three documents, and the one on the left is the Declaration of Independence. I'm looking at my time, I don't want to go on too long. I think we're not too bad, we're almost through. Um, <coughs> The night of the declaration, the text was sent over to a printer named John Dunlop. You may have heard of the Dunlop broadsides. And he printed up the text, but it had no names on it because it hadn't been signed yet. And uh, many of you know Norman Lear, the producer. He bought a Dunlop broadside and brought it all around the country to show that. So that's the, the first iteration of it. Then in August, they met to sign the hand written document that we think of as the Declaration of Independence. Then in January 1777, after victories at Trenton and Princeton, they decided maybe this will work, <laughs> and so we should uh, let the country know who the signers are. So this was issued, it gave the names of the signers. It is signed by John Hancock. He didn't sign all of them, but he did for his home state. So that's his signature, it's not a stamp. A um, couple of things about it, uh, Reese Witherspoon, you may know of her, uh, under uh, New Jersey, I think the, that name appears, that's an ancestor of Reese Witherspoon. And it was printed by a woman named Mary Catherine Goddard, she had a print shop. So a couple of years ago on the 4th of July, um, CBS News came here and they did the story about the woman who printed the Declaration of, of uh, Independence, and Secretary Galvin was interviewed about it. The one in the middle is the Bill of Rights, sent by President Washington in 1789. And um, a few years ago, we had the former Prime Minister of Italy here. His name is Giuliano Amato. He's an attorney, and he almost stepped back to see that. that this is one of the 14 originals of this world-famous document. So it gives you an, a sense of the importance of what we have here. And I can go on and on, but you know, I think you have the idea. The final one on the right is the first page of our Massachusetts Constitution. It was written by a committee, but the main author is John Adams. And um, it was a very important model for the federal Constitution. I went to a symposium a few years ago for our Supreme Judicial Court justices, and they had several experts on the Constitution. They said arguably that was the most important single model. They're quite similar, but this was done first. 
Um, we like to say we have all the, our propaganda. It's the oldest written constitution still <laughs> used in the world. The British is older, but it's not a single document. Uh, it's been um, amended, but not replaced. And when we have the school kids here, we explain that the royal charters are on vellum, which is a thicker animal skin. Uh, the two charters on the right are on parchment, which is also an animal skin. And the Massachusetts Constitution got torn, so it's sewn up in the left corner. You might look at that. Only the declarations on paper. So I, I usually give this when we're down there, but with the size group, I thought, you know, we'd do it here, and then you can go in and see, see them. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to stop talking, and I'd like you to come up and, you know, get a chance to look at these for a few minutes. And then we'll go down again and meet in the lobby. And we're going to be assisted ably by our students. We have uh, two students from Northeastern. We work with them, um, <clears throat> Olivia and Ann. And we also have a student from UMass Boston who was here in the morning with our school groups. That's Savannah. So they will be in the exhibit to, to give you some advice. And I will be there as well. And uh, after, so one group will see the Treasures Gallery while another group watches the film. And the film was just redone, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned, by uh, you know, bringing it up to date. Then we'll reverse. The ones who saw the film will go in the Treasures Gallery and so forth. Then we can start in. I'm going to take one group, and I'll spend about 20 minutes in the first gallery about the Puritans to give you a little more depth than we usually do with a group. And then after that, you can explore the other galleries, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it, and we'll have some guides there. If you're in the uh, Revolution Gallery, one thing I like, there's a early signature John Hancock. It doesn't look exactly like the Declaration, but has a lot of squiggles under it, so you see he's kind of working on it. Uh, another thing that's fun in there is Paul Revere's bill for riding. It would be a better story if it was for the midnight ride, but after the ride, he took some rides to publicize what happened, and he submitted expenses for self and horse during that time. <laughs> so you might see that. Uh, and then we have something where you can listen to uh, people telling their story, whether they determined to be a patriot or a Tory. And one that I like is Prince Hall. He was a black man who submitted many petitions to the Massachusetts government. And in doing that, we could actually use the words of Prince Hall. So every word, the actor isn't from him, but a lot of them are. Uh, there's also one about John Hancock, about Isaac Royal, and so forth. Uh, when you go into the Federal Gallery, we have uh, a Know Your Rights video exercise, sort of aimed at kids, but it's of interest to adults also, and it's not always obvious. And one of our judges, Hilders O'Bell, helped with that. And then we have a game for younger kids, a travel game, what it was like to travel around 1800. And everything in there actually happened. I, I found an account of a, a ship that went from Boston to the Cape and ran aground, ran into swells, all kinds of problems, and just we reversed it, and so, you know, that's real, all those things were real, all the things in that uh, story are real. Finally, we have uh, the 19th century gallery, we have these various things, the abolitionists, women suffragists, um, Dorothea Dix, the Industrial Revolution, and so forth. So, we'll highlight the first gallery, but I hope you get a chance to see a little bit of everything. So, I'm gonna step aside, and um, I want to also introduce Caitlin Jones, who is the reference, head of reference for the Massachusetts Archives. So we'll be here to maybe answer questions and slap you on the wrist if you try to take anything. So, all right. So please feel free to come up. And when you, after you've completed, uh, we'll meet down again in the lobby. This was the face of Massachusetts democracy in the early 18th century. But over the next 300 years, this limited idea of who could participate in the democratic process would change dramatically.